has had a more than 20 year career in business strategy consulting. Um, after graduating with political science from Columbia in 1997. Um, so I think that's all I'm gonna say by way of introduction. Um, and then I'll, I'll let John start. Um, the first question I have is to, I guess, start in the present and just tell us about your current work um, in, in business strategy consulting. Sure. Um, so it's actually quite fun. I'm, I'm uh, an independent consultant for the first time in my career meaning I created my own firm and I uh, work with some other consultants who um, are in similar positions, either smaller firms or on their own. Um, but the work that I've been doing recently has been mostly in healthcare and life sciences, not exclusively, but mostly. And for clients who aren't in that space, it's a question, the question I typically help them address is how to get into that space if they want to. Um, and so the work that I've been doing recently, just to give you a couple of examples of some of my clients. Uh, so I'm working for a large uh, pharmacy retailer. Uh, it's a global one, but it has a large presence in the U.S. too. It's one of the two largest in the U.S. And the question I've been helping them with is really a kind of corporate strategy question of they have a quite strong presence in pharmacy and in retail associated with that, but they don't really have a lot of other healthcare assets and capabilities. And so the question that they've come to me with to help them understand better is how should they kind of enter more substantially into the healthcare market? What kinds of assets would they need to have to do that? What kinds of customers would they target? What would be their value proposition? How do they kind of fit more broadly into the healthcare ecosystem? How do they make money if they do this relative to the current way in which they make money? So it's kind of a broad set of questions that they have really about their overall business strategy and approach to the healthcare market. Um, uh, some other examples of work that I've been doing recently. So I've been working with the medical affairs team at a life sciences company, helping them to figure out how they're how to approach their business or their their responsibilities within the life sciences company so medical affairs is primarily responsible for doing things like designing aspects of clinical trials but also interacting with healthcare professionals directly um, around the data and information related to a disease area and the treatments that are available including the treatments from their own company so uh, the work that i've been doing with them is to help the medical affairs team think more strategically and really try to understand more precisely what it is that their healthcare professionals that they're interacting with, what they really care about, what's going to motivate them, what the needs of the patients are that connect to their business. Um, so kind of reframing some of what they do in, in, through a business lens. Um, and then a final example of something that I'm doing is I'm working with a, an industrial manufacturer right now, and um, they have a new product that is a air filtration system um, and not a space that I would normally be in, but the reason that they've asked me to help them is that this is a, a system that is going to kill pretty much all pathogens that are floating around in the air. So particularly in this period where we're in the pandemic and we're thinking about the aerosolization of viruses and how that might or might not impact disease transmission and infection rates, this is a product that can clean the air in a way that no existing product can at a level that no existing product can. Um, and so they're really trying to figure out, they know that there's gonna be demand for it. They also know, well, they anticipate they're gonna launch in this product in early 2021. So given the nature of ramping up manufacturing, the question for them really is where should we go first? Where's gonna be the most high value, high impact, place that uh, we can go with this and how are customers going to respond to this? How would they think about the installation? Which kinds of facilities would they put it in? So we're doing a lot of work for them on basically a customer strategy and a market and a launch strategy for them. So that's some examples. Is that helpful, Rachel? And just give a sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's really helpful. It, it kind of demystifies a little bit about consulting, gives you a sense of the kinds of business problems that, that people are actually talking about and trying to figure out. Um, I'm curious though, so you're, you got your PhD in political science and now you, you've been focusing on healthcare. Um, how, did you, how did you get there? That's a, it's kind of a long answer, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll give you the moderately short version of it. Uh, so yeah, I did my PhD in political science there as in international politics. Um, and you know, probably in the last couple of years of, of writing my dissertation decided that the academia probably wasn't going to be the right path for me. Um, so I did, I kind of 
too attractive essentially. So I did do, I did go on the market for about a year and had a postdoc at Ohio State um, and was kind of choosing between that and, and going into consulting. And so I decided that, um, uh, the, well, the offer that I ended up with was the place called Monitor Group, uh, which I can talk, talk more about. But anyways, uh, to kind of dramatize the choice in front of me, it was kind of like, I can either join them and go to London, or I can take the postdoc and go to Columbus. <laughs> and so London was pretty appealing. Uh, and so I ended up there. It was not an, and it was not an industry-focused firm. It was really a strategy-focused firm. So it had been created by a professor at Harvard Business School, Michael Porter, who in many ways is the progenitor of the academic discipline of business strategy uh, back in the late 70s and early 1980s. He founded this company in 82. So the work that I originally started doing was really around business unit strategy, corporate strategy, growth strategy, and it was industry agnostic. So it was really kind of a methodological approach to how do you solve these kind of complicated multidimensional problems. And uh, over time, uh, I started to migrate a little bit into life sciences, uh, in part because it was just an industry that was paying a lot of money for those kinds of consulting services. Had a lot of needs around strategy in the late 90s and through the early part of the 2000s. Um, but it was never an exclusive part of what I did. Uh, the way I, I ended up actually in healthcare was um, Monitor got bought by Deloitte. And so at that point, that was an industry focused firm. And so they made us choose an industry. And, and from my perspective, there were a couple of really appealing things about healthcare at that point. So one was, um, I just thought that the nature of the strategic challenges that were confronting healthcare companies, this was in 2000, uh, 2013, was really, really compelling and interesting, right? It was kind of the, in the midst of the ACA taking place and what implications is that going to have for the way in which the industry is structured and how people partner together and how people compete differently and what the scale of these enterprises are. So there's some really interesting, meaty, intellectually hefty problems that the industry was confronting. And at the same time, there was a kind of moral purpose to it, right? I think we can all look around and say U.S. healthcare doesn't work in the way that we would like it to. And so there was an aspect of my moving into healthcare at the time, which was also partly driven by a belief that like, even if I could help around the margins and making healthcare better in the U.S., that was a good thing to be doing and a good place to be spending my time. Uh, and so that was the, around 2013 was when I made a commitment to be fully kind of focused on on healthcare and life sciences. Um, and so with a few exceptions here and there, that's more or less where I've been spending my my time and effort since then. Hmm, thank you. Um, so. I'd love it if you could go back um, to that that period that you mentioned. So you um, finishing your PhD the last couple of years, weren't sure if academia was the right place for you, but then you did do a postdoc and then, you know, kind of went off to London to join Monitor. Could you yeah. kind of tell us a little bit more about those, those few years and how that process was for you? Um, like, why did you decide to, to do that postdoc first? And... Um, and then if you remember any details about that first job search um, and what that process was and how you kind of, because I know a lot of doctoral students are, are interested in, in applying for all sorts of other things, but aren't quite sure how to get that first job and how to kind of represent their experience in graduate school to other kinds of employers. Yeah. Sure. Happy to do that. Um, and just to clarify, I actually didn't take the postdoc. I was oh, choosing between the postdoc and going to monitor. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, but yeah, happy to talk about that. So a little bit of background. I I started my PhD in 1990, and um, it was in international politics, international security, and the particular problem that I was interested in was U.S.-Soviet relations. Um, and uh, from an academic perspective, the Soviet Union sort of inconveniently fell apart a few years into my graduate work, and. And I, the reason I chose not to stay in academia was primarily because I didn't find any really compelling issues that I wanted to work on at that point. So I finished the dissertation and was, you know, kind of anticipating I was going to, to move on to something else. I didn't know for sure, which is why I was also pursuing this other track, but, um, but kind of anticipated that's the direction I was heading. And I made that, I kind of came to that conclusion probably about two years before I finished. So I finished in 97 and around 95 is when I really started to think about this seriously. And at the time I was on a pre-doctoral fellowship up at Harvard, uh, the Center for Science and International Security at the Kennedy School. 
And so I started kind of asking people, uh, you know, like what else is there out there? Because at that point I had gone straight through from my undergraduate. So I had been in university since 1986. It was now 1995. I was like, I don't want to go back and do another degree. I had no interest in getting an MBA. I didn't really want to go get a JD. Like there wasn't any, I didn't want to stay in, um, in school to be uh, honest. And so I started thinking about what else is out there. I came back to New York for my final year and there were a couple of, uh, of people who were close to me who were starting to be really helpful in focusing me on consulting. So there was a guy who was in my program, <clears throat> excuse me, he's now at Georgetown, a guy named Mark Bush. And Mark was doing the same PhD that I was, but in international economics, <clears throat> excuse me. And he had been at a consulting firm prior to going to graduate school. And so he was like, no, I think you would actually like this. I think it would be suitable to your interests and you'd find it kind of interesting and fun. And, and the value of doing a, a, a management consulting is that it kind of gives you a platform from which you can see a lot of other kinds of opportunities. And so I didn't really, and I had a, I had a friend from undergraduate who was a banker, uh, but he had spent his uh, interstitial years at, in business school in um, in consulting as a summer intern and also thought it would be a useful idea for me or a, a good path for me to go down. So that was the final year that I was in graduate school. And, um, and so the, the job search process for me when it, when it happened was really trying to figure out who would hire PhDs. And it was a relatively small number of consulting firms at the time who were actively recruiting PhDs. And, um, and so I applied to them, but I also realized that I was in no really good position to be able to successfully be recruited by them or successfully be a candidate at them. And I didn't really know what they were looking for. I didn't really know what kinds of interviews they were going to conduct. I didn't really understand how they solved problems or really even kind of what issues they addressed. And so... I spent a lot of time with some those two friends, but also another guy that I knew who ended up at McKinsey, who had also been at Columbia as a PhD student. He didn't finish, but he went to McKinsey. And they were really helpful to me. They, they would do mock interviews with me. They would kind of help me understand what kinds of questions I was going to be asked. They directed me to resources that were, that are now widely available online, but at the time, at the time weren't. And, uh, and so they really helped ground me essentially. And like, what's this experience going to be like when you get in front of people and they start trying to assess your suitability for being a business consultant. And then the other thing that I did in preparation was just to kind of get some basic terminology and understanding of the foundation of business. I ended up taking accounting and finance in my final year uh, during my PhD. So I was sitting in classes with a bunch of undergraduates learning accounting and finance. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't, I wouldn't say that it was kind of, revolutionary, but it was really helpful when I got into the interviews and people would talk about balance sheets and income statements and, you know, net present value. I at least had some basic understanding of the kinds of questions that they're asking and the kinds of analysis that would go into it. So that was the other preparation that I did. Um, so I went through the interview process and, and I, I personally just found monitor to be a really uh, good fit for me. So I think in part it was because the, genesis of the firm had been rooted in, in, you know, kind of an academic approach. And so it just kind of the people that they had there, the way in which they approached problems, the way in which they talked to each other, the way in which kind of the whole thing worked seemed to be really a good, a good transition for me out of academia into business. Hmm, thanks. That's really interesting. And it also reinforces, I know Francesca and I, when we talk to students and talk about the importance of networking, that it isn't only about, a lot of people think networking is like direct connections to jobs, but in your case, it seems like it was much more about information and preparation to make you a good candidate for jobs that you were applying to and um, to then kind of help you go through that application and interview process successfully. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, you know, my experience anyway with, uh, with recruiting, both going through it the way that I did, but also then when I was at Monitor, I ran our recruiting in North America for a couple of years, um, and then have in various capacities been highly involved in recruiting candidates um, at all levels. And it's almost never the case that uh, the, the person with whom you 
have some sort of relationship is a person who's going to make a hiring decision. At best, what it is, is they're, they're getting you potentially connected to people who can get you into a process of evaluation is about the best that that's going to be in terms of that sort of direct connection. But these informational interviews, they're really, really important and really helpful. So they are, you know, they're really, for me anyway, they were central to my success in being able to prepare for the interviews. Um, but they also give you potentially different ideas. Um, and so, you know, like I happened to be pretty focused at the time on business consulting, but, you know, at other points when I've been talking to people, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And, I, you know, it's, it's been helpful in those instances just to like hear other people's ideas, hear what they've been doing. And it kind of sparks some potential different ways of thinking about your, your path. And um, so I think for both of those reasons, using your network is really critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm curious to hear, so you just were talking about like, so the key things that helped you get that first job um, were these informational interviews and, and preparation. And it sounds like even taking those two undergraduate courses, you point out that you think was a, a good, helpful thing. Um, is there anything else that you can point to? And I know I have, this was a long time ago, and I have a hard time answering this question when people ask me, but any other um, aspects of graduate school that really helped prepare you for your work in consulting? Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I've actually gotten that question quite a lot of her over the course of time because uh, I've, you know, not infrequently spoken to PhDs in particular who are looking at consulting. In addition to the things that I already mentioned, I would say that there, for me anyway, I felt that there was a real value in the PhD itself in a couple of different ways. So one is I do think that there's, um, there's a way in which a PhD experience creates intellectual discipline, rigor, and structure in your thinking that can apply to almost any kind of business situation. Um, now the particular analytic tools that you might be using and the techniques and those kinds of things, those will be really different. Um, obviously the content of what you're doing is gonna be really different in most cases. But the way in which you kind of structure problems or you break them down into constituent component parts and understand how you address those, what kind of data would answer those questions, how you would get that data, that's all really, really useful, at least in a consulting environment. I can't speak to other kinds of environments, but in a consulting environment, that's really, really helpful because at the end of the day, that's essentially what you're doing for your clients is trying to take a problem that they don't really understand and kind of parameterize it for them, like characterize it in a way that you can solve it, break it down into solvable parts, and then go get information that helps them answer those questions so that they can make decisions. So in that way, I think that the the approach of PhD candidates and PhDs is pretty helpful. I would say the other thing that was helpful for me specifically about a social science PhD was that, um, you know, social sciences are kind of messy, uh, right? For better and for worse. There's, you know, if you're doing a, if you're, if you're kind of writing a paper or writing a book, typically the topic doesn't have a clear answer and it doesn't actually have very clear data. And so you're, pulling together some quantitative data and you're doing some interviews and you have some secondary research that you've done from the literature and you're kind of putting that together into an argument. Business consulting has a lot of similarities to that in that there's almost never clear data to answer a question. And so you're putting together things that essentially look a lot like an argument, um, right? You're kind of, you're coming up with a point of view and a set of hypotheses that you're presenting to your client about the right path forward for them. But it's, all, and it's, it's grounded in data, but it's not super clean data. And so that I found also was pretty helpful, the ability to live with some ambiguity in the information that you have, but still be able to come to some conclusions and recommendations. I felt like it, uh, that partly grew out of my experience in the PhD program. Hmm, that's really helpful. Um, and now I'm curious, so then you, know, you have experience, a lot of experience hiring and recruiting, you said too. Um, so what do you look for, um, or, or does it change depending on, this, on the search you're doing, but what do you look for in, um, in hiring, in particular PhDs for consulting positions? 
Yeah. Well, I do think it varies quite a bit by uh, the organization. So I'll start with that, that as, as a caveat, but um, speaking of it from the perspective of monitor, which I think is more similar to what, you know, pr probably what I'm about to say is going to be reasonably similar to what you might experience at Bain, McKinsey, and BCG as well, um, which is they're primarily looking for, I'd say, first of all, simply intellectual horsepower. So they're going to give you a bunch of problems to do in their interviews, and they want to be able to see that you kind of like, you can do the work. And so that's generally for a PhD student fairly easily done, but it's still important to do. I would say that they will look for your ability to be flexible and adaptable to applying your thinking in a business environment. So they will want you to kind of have some familiarity with the terminology, stuff like that. They won't really care that much about your background. So really, you mentioned as we're coming into this call, Rachel, that there are people on here who are you know, physics PhDs and art history PhDs and economists, and we don't really care about that for the most part. Um, you know, Generally, the view is they're probably going to be pretty smart people. Their, you know, their background is going to be largely irrelevant in terms of content of what they're doing anyway. So training them in business is kind of what we do and when we hire PhDs and, and it's our anticipation that what we're really hiring is we're hiring somebody who's a really good structured thinker that will be able to get them adapted to the business environment. I will say the, the thing that we often work cautious on with PhDs is that um, consulting is a pretty team-based endeavor and so we were a little bit cautious on hiring PhDs and we would test more actively for their ability to be team oriented and collaborative. And so, um, cause I do think that there's, you know, there's at least a reputation, some of which is deserved that PhDs kind of like to do their own work and they like to, you know, I think that varies by discipline to some degree, but, but I do think it's a reputation that persists out there. And so being able to, you know, kind of, talk about your interest and enthusiasm for working with others, talk about some examples of when you may have done it, um, and to potentially demonstrate it in interviews. Some places do actually do group interviews where they bring multiple candidates together and have them solve a business problem together and observe what happens. So being really sensitive as a PhD student to, to that particular topic, I think is really helpful and important as well. Um, I think other places, other places are, are a little bit more, I would say, focused on particular kinds of PhDs. So, for example, um, I've been working with a small life sciences consulting firm, uh, and they do hire PhDs, but they're really, they want to hire PhDs who have some sort of technical background in life sciences, not because they think that the, the biology PhD is actually going to do any kind of lab work or bench work with in biology but they want them to be conversant in the basic science of the industry and they think that that gives them credibility with their clients and so there are places who will hire specifically around those kinds of issues and topic areas that are appropriate and applicable to their to their industry that they serve um, but for general consulting firms that's less true mm -hmm. And would those be boutique firms? Is that the, when people talk about boutique consulting, is that kind of what, what is meant by that? Yeah, kind of. I mean, the, it, it's, a, it's a loose term to talk about boutique consulting firms. And, um, but, you know, if you, if you kind of think about relative scale and size, a place like Deloitte or PwC is kind of at one end of that. They're $30 billion enterprises with tens of thousands of people. You know, then you kind of have the, you know, you kind of have the classic strategy firms of, Bay McKinsey and BCG. McKinsey's starting to get pretty big now. It's getting up close to 10 billion, but Bain's probably more in the kind of 2 billion range. Um, we kind of think about anything maybe sub 500 million as a boutique firm, mm -hmm. um, but you know, even those can be a thousand people. So they, they're not like tiny, um, but yeah, that, that would be generally speaking a boutique firm. And, uh, and generally speaking, I would say, that kind of orientation toward hiring discipline specific PhDs tends to be more applicable to 
firms that are industry focused, whether they're big or small. So if there's a real industry focus, they tend to hire in, in areas that seem adjacent to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I, just a couple other questions about um, some of the things that you said about things that, that you look for or that consulting firms in general look for when hiring PhDs. And um, yeah. I'd heard a lot about the collaboration and teamwork and those kind of parts of the interview process that try to assess that. And in terms of examples, of, so you know, a lot of graduate students are trying to figure out how to gain experience during graduate school to make them good candidates for these positions on paper so that they can get to the interview round. And what are kind of examples of things that you, you would see even like on a resume of teamwork and collaboration kinds of experience that graduate students can, can get involved in? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I'll answer the question and I actually want to come back to another point on PhDs too in terms of hiring process. But um, it can be a lot of different things. You know, it can be, it, so it could be anything from like let's say you're a natural sciences phd and you're working in somebody's lab like talking about what that lab interaction looks like and experiments that you may have conducted in collaboration with other people or papers that you may have been a co-author co on those are all really valuable ways of demonstrating teamwork and collaboration potentially you can also look for things that kind of sit outside the direct PhD work that you're doing, but are still potentially within the academy. So as an example, um, we used to, uh, I don't know if they still do it, but, um, but at SIPA, they used to run these uh, kind of simulations. They're kind of like sort of advanced model UNs, I guess. But they were basically like, you know, like simulating the kind of interaction that you might have between states on a particular topic. And the intent was to generate some insight and you know allow people then to go off and kind of write about it. Um, but you know, so I participated in those. I didn't do it with the intent that I was going to be able to demonstrate that this was collaborative. Like it was just kind of interesting to me to do. But you can take those kinds of experiences and say, hey, I did this for a couple of days. I really enjoyed it. Here's what I liked about it. Here's the kind of interaction and interplay that I really enjoyed on the people who were on my team and how we interacted with the other teams. Um, you can also do it through things like when I was at Columbia, I was on the admissions committee for the PhD program in political science. So as a student representative on that, that counted too, right? So you can, there are lots of things that all of us do uh, in our lives that actually are interacting with other people. It just sometimes requires you to use a different lens on those than you might otherwise use, right? And so, um, uh, I think the temptation of a lot of PhD students in these interviews can be to be just super focused on the work that they've done and the publications and stuff like that. And that's, I will say that is valuable, you know, when you kind of send your resume in and you have those marks of success and achievement, those are, those are useful. People will pay attention to them, but being able to pull out these other kinds of experiences, even if they weren't intentionally designed to demonstrate collaboration, they do demonstrate collaboration. I think the, you know, kind of the attempt to go do that, to resume build essentially on that is a little trickier um, than to do it naturally. But uh, so the, the other thing I wanted to come back to though, um, just in terms of what else they'll look for, there will be things that they test for that are different for different PhDs potentially. So to, just to kind of be aware of it. Um, and I was prompted in my thinking about this because thinking about you know, some of the preparation that I did. Um, the PhD that I wrote, the dissertation I wrote was not quantitative at all. Um, and you know, frankly, after I was uh, done in, with my undergraduate education, I basically didn't do math again until I became a consultant. And so uh, I was sensitive to, they're gonna want me to demonstrate some basic quantitative skills. Now I wanna be clear, these are not quantitative skills of like, oh, you know, even they're not even calculus, right? These are basic algebraic skills of like understand kind of how to manipulate variables and do quick calculations and estimates. But um, but they will test for that, particularly in disciplines that are not quantitative. Um, so if you are a political scientist or you know 
and you know coming out of an English department or art history or something like that, they will absolutely test for quantitative skills. Again, like don't go overboard on trying to like get to college level calculus. Just like get really rapid in your thinking about basic math and um, and basic calculations. Uh, you know, for for people who are from more quantitative disciplines, that's pretty simple, and they don't. They assume if you're a physics PhD, you probably know your math pretty well. <laughs> that, you anticipated my next question, because that is what I was going to ask after the question about collaboration, about quantitative skills, because that is certainly the perception, um, is that that's, that's something that's valued, but I think that's helpful to know kind of the extent to which that's important and, and the nature of the skills that are um, that are being asked for. There's nothing, you know, super advanced, but just a facility and, and even just a comfort with, you know, having to talk about numbers. Yeah. And it's, you know, you will, you will see some moderately complex math done in consulting projects sometimes, but it's not, it's not something, it's not a skill that they assume you're going to have coming into it. And frankly, there are so many software tools out there now that basically do it for you, right? Like you basically, you really just kind of have to understand how the data fits together, how the variables fit together, how to use the data and put it into the programs and, and then they'll solve the problems for you. But, um, but I, I do think you're right. The facility with it's really important. And as much as anything, the facility with quantitative information and how to interpret it. So like, it's one thing to be able to do the calculations, but to be able to kind of take that information and say, so what, what do I make of this? Like, what does it mean? Um, how does it fit into any kind of patterns that I'm observing from other pieces of information that I have about the client's issues that will allow me to say something insightful and helpful to them? Um, so the, the facility with the data and the quantitative skills around it, yeah, they're partly about doing the analysis, but they're mostly about how do you make them how do you interpret them accurately and in interesting ways? Mm -hmm. Great, that's really helpful. So um, I think I'm gonna open it up now to, um, to questions from the group for John, um, either about his own experience or about consulting in general. Um, feel free to, it's a, it's a small group now, so I think you can even probably just unmute yourself and ask. <laughs> 